Let us discuss today uh, the use of uh, time and frequency distribution for coherent software-defined radio networking and how this applies to distributed passive uh, multi-static uh, radar synchronization. So in the presentation that we're going to uh, discuss is uh, a system where uh, an emitter is radiating electromagnetic waves uh, towards space and multiple receivers, software-defined radio receivers, will be recording the echoes uh, returned by a moving target. And the question we wish to answer here is how can we synchronize these multiple spatially distributed receivers so that the recording is coherent and allows for phase analysis. So that's, that's the outline of the discussion of uh, this presentation. But first of all, let us uh, discuss why we wish to have uh, this kind of uh, distributed uh, passive radar. Radar is radio frequency detection and ranging, and most civilian applications will not allow to have powerful emitters, uh, dedicated powerful emitters. So if, for example, you wish to have a passive multistatic radar, uh, then you will be using existing electromagnetic emitters and looking at the return signal from uh, planes or moving targets. So we benefit from existing high, po high power emitters. And why would we have multi-static radar? Well, first of all, because if you just have a single reception point, then you will only know the range uh, to the target from the, from the receiver, the bi-static range from receiver to target, but you will not be able to locate the target. So you will need some special diversi diversity if you want to identify where this target is located. Furthermore, multi-static radar breaks the assumption of a stealth uh, aircraft where it is assumed that the emitter and receiver are co-located and the flat surfaces from stealth aircraft will prevent uh, electromagnetic wave from being returned from the incoming signal here. But in a multi-static architecture, this uh, assumption is uh, broken because this uh, emitter will be reflected towards uh, a whole range of directions and um, it is assumed that stealth aircraft will be detectable using multi-static uh, uh, re uh, reception systems. So uh, this technique of synchronization synchronizing multiple receivers, uh, spatially, uh, spatial diversity of uh, multiple receivers is applicable to any kind of uh, um, location system, whether very long uh, baseline interferometry, distributed particle detectors, direction of arrival measurement systems, all these kind of spatially distributed uh, rece receiver reception systems. So furthermore, um, we might consider additional applications uh, of uh, uh, synchronizing uh, di spatially distributed uh, systems, including uh, 5G uh, communication networks, uh, trading, where we want to have multiple uh, stock exchange synchronized with sub-microsecond accuracy, uh, network security, where you have encryption keys that you want to avoid repeating so that an attacker cannot uh, replay the same sequence of the encryption key. Uh, GPS is based on uh, synchronizing by for using trilateration to know where you're located on the surface of the Earth. So all these devices will require some sort of synchronization. So usually what you would do in such a system is to have a free running local clock and the better the accuracy, the better the, the clock that is needed. So for example, for very ba long baseline interferometry, you would have at each reception site uh, a rubidium cesium clock or hydrogen maser and uh, at some point you would synchronize these uh, clocks for example by watching a common source at the beginning of the observation and assume that these clocks would not drift uh, during the duration of the observation if they are stable enough. So that's one approach and in this case if you would for example synchronize your clocks using the uh, common uh, GPS observation, so the, um, by receiving the same constellation on multiple sites, typically your 1 PPS signal would be in the uh, 30 to 100 nanosecond uh, range for L1 only uh, receivers. Uh, if you have a dual frequency um, L1, L2 receiver, you can drop this uh, to a few nanoseconds. And if you wish to observe 
uh, source, uh, a radio frequency source for radio application in the 100 megahertz to 10 uh, to, to 1 gigahertz. Well, 100 megahertz is 10 nanosecond uh, period. Uh, 1 gigahertz would be one nanosecond period, and ob obviously, synchronizing to a few nanoseconds will not be sufficient for phase analysis of the uh, signal re uh, uh, observed by by these uh, uh, spatially distributed uh, receivers. So, if we consider that we wish to have uh, an accuracy of five uh, angular degree um, uh, so at one gigahertz uh, if we say that one period one nanosecond is 360 degrees then five degree phase resolution would require 14 picosecond uh, timing uh, uh, resolution in, in synchronizing the various uh, receivers uh, if we take the same objective a five uh, angular degree uh, phase uh, resolution at 100 megahertz, that's a more reasonable 140 picosecond, but nevertheless, these are sub nanosecond synchronization requirements. And requi remember that light is propagating at a very slow pace of 300 meter per microsecond. So that means that if we have a few tens of centimeter between our reception array, uh, then uh, we will have a challenge in synchronizing the receivers because just uh, uh, propagating a synchronization signal just because uh, the speed of light is finite, uh, we will not be able to synchronize using this uh, approach. So we absolutely need two-way uh, time and frequency transfer compensation on active uh, links where the two-way time transfer is measured and compensated for at each end of the link, assuming that uh, the link is symmetric, uh, that uh, back and forth uh, time delay is, uh, is the same, and uh, that this uh, compensation is fast enough. It's, it's an active link because this uh, path might change due to temperature, due to stress in the fibers or in the cables, and so this active compensation needs to be a, a constant feedback loop. This is actually what is implemented in the White Rabbit uh, PTP architecture uh, developed by CERN. So at CERN, the uh, accelerator in Switzerland, uh, they wish to uh, measure the synchronously the beam through their, their uh, ring, um, LHC ring. And uh, again, because uh, the electromagnetic wave is propagating at 300 meters per microsecond, then uh, synchronizing uh, over the uh, 20 kilometer ring would require a few uh, hundred microsecond delay, uh, which is not acceptable in the application. So what they did is they developed a two-way uh, compensation measurement scheme using a gigabit Ethernet dark fiber network uh, that compensates for the propagation uh, duration using a commercial uh, small form factor pluggable transceivers, gigabit Ethernet uh, 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 radio um, optical transceivers, um, and these are now made available as the commercially available white rabbit switches. Uh, we will show later why uh, you should avoid uh, anything other than the uh, white rabbit switch for this application. So the architecture of this uh, PTP uh, time synchronization system is that one grandmaster uh, is given a, a reference one PPS, one pulse per second and the 10 megahertz. In our case, it will be the output of hydrogen maser. This will be uh, assumed to be the perfect reference. And the various uh, nodes will be receiving from the grandmaster uh, this uh, synchronization signal. They will themselves act as masters to uh, synchronize leaves, which might be uh, digital timestamping. So that would be your digital input output DIO. It could be analog to digital converters. It could be digital to analog converters or direct digital synthesizers. So all these radio frequency uh, syn synthesis or acquisition systems that you would like to synchronize. And uh, because this uh, two-way uh, time and frequency transfer is compensated for, uh, we uh, expect all these nodes to be time synchronous. So what we observed, these are measurements from Eric Meyer at Besançon Observatory, uh, is that a standard deviation on the various uh, one PPS uh, in a two kilometer long uh, link is typically uh, one standard deviation of 60 picoseconds. And 60 picosecond jitter on the one pulse per second output is about three degrees at 150 megahertz. So that's within the uh, objective of direction of arrival measurement for distributed radar systems. Uh, there's a very active community of uh, users, uh, some developers uh, answering uh, the uh, 
forums, discussion forums, uh, mainly these, uh, if you look at the tutorials uh, and the workshops, you will see that the contributors are mainly from particle accelerator and particle detectors, again, because distributed particle detectors will allow to map the uh, particle shower, uh, and so these are the people interested in this uh, distributed system. Yet, uh, now, uh, White Rabbit is part of PTPV2 standard, and it could be expected that the uh, contributor audience will widen beyond uh, particle accelerator and detectors. So, uh, why are we talking about 143 megahertz? Um, well, the passive radar application that we wish to demonstrate this on is uh, using the GRAV radar um, uh, emitter located uh, 30 kilometer from uh, the laboratory uh, where this setup is installed. So we're located in Besançon, uh, northeast of France, uh, 47 degree north, 6 degree east. And uh, 30 kilometer from there is a former uh, Air Force base, which has now been converted as a radar emitter station. Uh, GRAV is the space surveillance uh, radar network with an emitter uh, located northeast of France. The receiver is located located south of France on the Plateau d'Albion, the former uh, nuclear missile uh, launch site. And GRAV is emitting at 143 megahertz. So that's a well-known uh, signal for amateur radio uh, for uh, locking your, your local oscillator. And so there's something about a 400 kilowatt in the publicly available information uh, radio frequency emission uh, from GRAV, uh, which of course will be reflected by any aircraft or airplane flying uh, in this uh, area. Now, uh, in, on the recep reception side here in Besançon, we have uh, three uh, locations where we can have this white rabbit network here in the time and frequency department of FEM2ST located at uh, NCM uh, Engineering School. We have the Besançon Observatory with a distance of about 400, 400 meters here between these two sites. And we have a university uh, teaching location here, which is another uh, uh, 200 meters from the Besançon Observatory. So here we have a network uh, which is about 500 uh, meter length that allows us to have this uh, spatial distribution. At the moment, the demonstration will be done with uh, the white rabbit uh, switches located, co-located all at the time and frequency department here. We have four antennas located on the roof of uh, the NSEM building here. And we check that uh, here the two uh, white rabbit switches, which are actually connected through the two kilometer uh, optical fiber. So the optical fiber is actually doing this whole round trip. Uh, but that at the moment, the two uh, white rabbit uh, switches will be co-located so that we can check uh, that the one PPS is properly aligned and that the radio frequency, the 10 megahertz radio frequency signal uh, remains uh, phase aligned. So that's, that's the experimental setup that will be used. Uh, actually, kind of uh, funny is that when your carrier frequency is 143 megahertz close to 150 megahertz, then the Doppler shift is, uh, remember that with radar systems, the Doppler shift is twice uh, the carrier frequency times the velocity divided by the speed of light, twice because once the wave is incoming and like, then uh, bouncing back from the target, and so that's twice uh, the, the carrier frequency. So kind of surprisingly, or amusingly, the uh, frequency offset is equal to the velocity in meter per second. So because this uh, 2 times 150 megahertz cancels with the 300 meter per microsecond, and you're just left with the velocity meter per second in your Doppler shift. So this means that we expect the Doppler shift introduced by civilian planes, uh, subsonic uh, uh, civilian planes, to be in the 300 hertz uh, range with a sign inducing whether the plane is incoming if it's positive or outgoing uh, outbound plane if it's uh, a negative Doppler shift. And so again, we wish to add spatial diversity to complement uh, the uh, Doppler velocity because this is a continuous wave radar, so there is no range information. It's a, uh, when uh, for space surveillance, all you need to know is the velocity of a satellite to get all the orbital parameters. You don't need to know the, t the range to the satellite. And so here we have this continuous wave um, that only gives us uh, the, the velocity of the flying aircraft, and we wish to add direction of arrival thanks to this. Uh, partial diversity of the, of the receivers. So what does the actual setup look like? We have these white rabbit switches 
and uh, the radio frequency reception will be using uh, X310 ATUS Research uh, software defined radio receivers. Now, you can use the X310 in many uh, ways, and the usual way would be to have a radio frequency transposition stage where you would have a local oscillator at 143 MHz, more or less, and you would transpose the radio frequency, radio frequency signal to baseband before recording. However, in uh, most ATUS research uh, frequency transposition systems, uh, you will have uh, an incoherent local oscillator um, so that this frequency transposition would lose the coherency that you bring by feeding the X310 with the 10 MHz and 1 PPS. So the, the, uh, the 1 PPS and 10 MHz uh, reference signal provided by the right rabbit switch to each X310 uh, software defined radio receiver will uh, phase and frequency lock the analog to digital converter, uh, converter fr uh, sampling frequency, but if we put here an additional phase lock loop, this phase lock loop will not be disciplined by the 10 MHz reference signal and we will lose this phase coherency. So actually we need a way of keeping this uh, phase and frequency coherence when sampling the 143 MHz uh, graph radar. And what we're doing actually is we're using on purpose the second uh, Nyquist zone uh, as uh, presented in this uh, Software Defined Radio Academy uh, tutorial, where if, um, if you're sampling at the 200 mega sample per second, analog to digital converter directly connected uh, to the graph signal, which is just amplified here with a, a radio radio frequency amplifier, well, this 200 megahertz, mega sample per second signal will be ranging from uh, plus or minus Nyquist frequency, which will be 100 megahertz. So we have uh, a baseband signal, which is plus or minus 100 megahertz. And by aliasing the 143 megahertz on purpose, we will have an alias at 56.95 megahertz. So the assumption here is that there is no noisy signal in this baseband and that only the alias of the uh, graph radar will be detected uh, in baseband. So what we're doing is we're recording using a, a basic RX, so that's uh, just a balloon uh, which feeds the antenna signal to the, um, to the analog to digital converter. And because we've just said that the graph, rate, the graph signal reflected by moving planes will be a few hundred hertz from the carrier, well, actually, this is a very narrow band signal that we will uh, collect uh, around the 56.95. So actually, uh, the, the uh, ATUS Research X310 will sample at 200 mega sample per second, will perform the frequency transposition from 56.95 to baseband using the numerically controlled oscillator implemented in the FPGA. And then we have a cascade of fear filters to uh, reduce the 1.5 megahertz uh, sampling bandwidth of uh, the ATUS Research X310 uh, to a few uh, hundred hertz. So in this case, we selected to have something like 800 hertz bandwidth around baseband, which is more than enough to observe the uh, plane uh, reflection. So that's the architecture of the receiver. And all these X310 that you see here are uh, frequency synchronized over uh, frequency and time synchronized by the output 1 PPS and 10 megahertz from the uh, white rabbit switches. So this is what uh, the, the actual GNU radio flowchart looks like. We have this USRP multiple sources. It's important that all these USRP sources are running on the same computer because it's this same uh, instance of uh, GNU radio that will broadcast the message to all X310 that they must synchronize on the next PPS. Uh, so that's one of the requirements that we will be discussing. This cannot be distributed on multiple computers. It's the same computer that must run this multi USRP uh, block. And then the output of the four uh, basic RX uh, X310 outputs will be fed, uh, first of all, on, on a time sync. We're going to see this later. And uh, we have this cascade of low pass filters uh, to uh, bring the 1.5 uh, megahertz uh, uh, sampling rate to the targeted uh, 800 hertz uh, bandwidth. Uh, cascading fear filters avoid having an excessive number of taps and requiring excessive uh, computation load on, on the computer, because here we already have four channels uh, with all these filters. Uh, it might be that the CPU is not able to, to, per, to, to process all the, the samples, so cascading the, the fear filters reduces the computational load. So here's an example of the output. So we have here the carrier from uh, Grav, 
and all these guys here are moving targets so these are the uh, moving uh, planes that are detected by our system here you see the impact of the stability of the local oscillator so what we're seeing here is the Doppler shift introduced by uh, by the moving plane and if you have a poor quality local oscillator that's the internal oscillator of the, of the X310 because here we have a very narrow frequency range you see here that we have only plus or minus 300 hertz well this local oscillator is going to drift over time by a few tens of hertz and your plane here which is uh, the uh, the, the x-axis is the velocity of a plane, the y-axis is, is a waterfall, so it's the time evolution of the velocity. So here we see that the plane is uh, coming from far away, coming close to the, uh, uh, to the bistatic null uh, velocity, which is when the uh, velocity is orthogonal to the path between the source and the receiver, and then the velocity becomes negative as the plane is going away. And this will be very difficult to analyze because this local oscillator is not stable, so that the frequency of a local oscillator is drifting and the analysis with respect to graph and the analysis of the velocity will be challenging. This is uh, the same signal clocked on the hydrogen maser, on, on the time and frequency department hydrogen maser, which is obviously much more stable than the X310 local oscillator. And here you see the same plane, except that now the X axis is flipped because we're using the uh, upper Nyquist zone so that um, now what used to be a positive velocity has become a negative uh, velocity due to the uh, symmetry along the Nyquist uh, frequency. And here we have again the same pattern of the plane uh, incoming, crossing the uh, uh, bistatic baseline and outgoing uh, in the other direction. So that's the kind of chart that we expect. And uh, each one of these uh, quantities is a complex number. Here we're plotting the magnitude, but from the phase uh, analysis, we can estimate the direction of arrival. Again, also, the, we saw that we need to amplify the antenna signal. Uh, this is using a power amplifier. We see the impact of the noise introduced by the amplifier. These are low noise amplifiers. And again, you see very obviously that with a power amplifier, you might see the strongest target, but the weaker plane targets will be uh, hidden in noise. And here is uh, the same plane detected uh, here by uh, FlightRadar24, which sees this plane. So uh, we are located. Uh, in uh, Besançon and uh, the, the, the emitter is located cl uh, close to uh, Gray, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the graph location and uh, here we have the uh, bistatic velocity of this plane crossing the path of uh, the Besançon graph uh, baseline. Uh, if we have a look at a plane that uh, turns as it is flying, well, you see that in terms of velocity, this means that the projection of this velocity uh, is changing as the plane is, is turning. And uh, as the plane is turning here, you see very obviously on this uh, waterfall, the uh, change in velocity, which means that the projected velocity is, is uh, changing abruptly. Uh, and again, here we uh, are able to do this analysis because the hydrogen maser exhibits an excellent stability and the Doppler is directly an, an image of the velocity of uh, the, the frequency offset uh, due to the Doppler is directly an image of the velocity of a plane. So once we've got these uh, traces where we have the magnitude uh, along the the time here uh, showing the, 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 the velocity evolution as seen by multiple antennas where we can analyze the phase and the phase will give us an indication of the direction of arrival and uh, what we need to do here is automated tracking. Uh, remember that uh, these are multiple Fourier transform one after the other so there is no consistency between this, these points and we need to, to do some image processing to track uh, the, the magnitude maximum and extract the phase along these, uh, these paths uh, which allows us to uh, recover the direction of arrival of, of the signal. So uh, this is applicable to commercial civilian flights and actually over Besançon there's quite a few uh, military flight training and these are very obvious to detect uh, as a commercial flight is flying along a, a straight line usually so you have this arc tangent uh, projection of the velocity and a military plane will be uh, turning around or moving sharply so that you have a very much more active uh, trice and furthermore you have these uh, uh, short uh, um, reflection on the plane as it is uh, turning around or moving sharply uh, it will be exhibit exhibiting uh, flat surfaces 
reflecting the graph signal towards the receiver. So that, that's actually the signature of uh, fighter jets as opposed to commercial flights, civilian commercial flights. Now, uh, we wish to benefit from White Rabbit, which is a gigabit Ethernet, uh, to propagate all these data. We have uh, these X310 distributed at multiple sites, and all these sites are hidden between uh, network firewalls. So, uh, university has its own firewall, the observatory has its own firewall, NSEM, uh, the engineering school, has a firewall, FEM2ST has a firewall, and we would need to have uh, tunneling all through all these firewalls, which will, of course, lower the data rates and, and this kind of uh, a pain to, to go through all these uh, uh, security measures. So because we have all these dark fibers, we would like to propagate uh, the data over the White Rabbit uh, network. And actually, that's not so obvious. That's why I mentioned avoid uh, using anything else but White Rabbit switches. The White Rabbit switches will uh, propagate digital data, so the payload, from one uh, port to the other, as opposed to the seven solution. Then uh, we requested from the support of seven solutions, uh, information about uh, forwarding a data packet from one SFP to the other, and that is just not possible. So you should avoid using the Zen and uh, just stay with the white uh, rabbit switches, which is open source, open hardware, so you have much better maintenance over time. The only challenge that we met is that the white rabbit switches uh, will have a challenge uh, handling the X310 uh, jumbo frames, which are large MTU uh, used to uh, reduce the overhead of of uh, uh, digital communication uh, overhead over the payload. And so these, uh, these large MTU here usually are not propagated by white rabbit switches. Nevertheless, they were uh, kind enough to inform us on how to configure uh, the switches so that the X310 uh, 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 propagate. If you meet this kind of issue, you might also know that uh, by introducing a gigabit Ethernet uh, switch between the X310 and the white rabbit switch, gigabit Ethernet will split the um, jumbo frames into smaller frames with uh, a 1500 byte uh, size uh, as uh, provided by Ethernet and these will uh, propagate nicely through the white rabbit switches. Because our final application only requires audio frequency streaming, we would not expect a significant impact on uh, uh, the White Rabbit uh, synchronization. You should not probably uh, propagate uh, hundreds of mega samples per second over White Rabbit switch if you want to keep the uh, uh, excellent synchronization capability. But in our case, we're looking only for uh, audio frequency data rate. The spec uh, PCI Express uh, board, the embedded board, as opposed to the White Rabbit switches, um, at the moment we're still investigating how they can handle uh, data. We know that the data are reaching the FPGA. It's not obvious how the data are exposed to the Linux system uh, handling the spec board. So this is uh, under investigation. Now, so far we've been using this upper Nyquist zone, but we might actually wonder if it's possible to uh, have the uh, synchronous local oscillator on each uh, X310 node. We mentioned that if you have a free-running PLL uh, on the X310 before the A2D converter, this uh, uh, free-running PLL will not uh, be a phase uh, synchronous, but maybe we can find a better solution than a free-running PLL, which is programmed at the graph frequency, and that would allow us to do the usual approach of of uh, mixing the uh, signal received by the antenna uh, with the local oscillator and sample the uh, low frequency signal uh, rather than using the radio frequency uh, 100 mega, 200 mega sample per second X310 A to D converter. So we've been investigating uh, how to create a radio frequency signal which is coherent with the 1 PPS and 10 MHz output of, of uh, White Rabbit and uh, by watching the analog devices forum, discussion forums, we ended up finding the AD9548 which is a, a clock uh, network, a network clock synchronizer. And this network clock synchronizer, uh, initially we were a bit uh, baffled by the fact that you have multiple inputs and we were unable to find out how to uh, synchronize both on the 10 megahertz and 1 PPS. These inputs, these are actually uh, the AD9548, will only at any given time use a single one of these uh, reference input to uh, synchronize its output. And actually the, the solution was found in a U-Blocks uh, um, uh, white paper where they explained that actually you take the 10 megahertz 
megahertz as the clock source so the 10 megahertz provided by white rabbit will be here uh, the, the clock uh, the, the, the system clock and the one pps will be the reference input and by using the 10 megahertz as system clock and one pps as reference the uh, ad9548 will output uh, something between uh, dc and 450 megahertz uh, uh, radio frequency output uh, that is uh, phase and frequency stabilized so in our first experiment we use an octo clock to feed two AD9548 uh, clock distribution circuits and we wanted to assess whether the output signal would be frequency and phase stabilized so here you have a 1 PPS from the octo clock uh, which is uh, the, the 10 megahertz and 1 PPS distribution uh, isolator and we see here the two signals from the two uh, AD9548 which are phase synchronous so why is this phase uh, stability mandatory? Well, actually, just a quick reminder about what is phase noise. So phase stability we've seen is needed for uh, direction of arrival measurement and phase stability will exhibit a standard deviation if we just take a scalar estimate. But actually, if you look at the time of flight of the signal between the various receivers, you might be interested in uh, not only a, a standard deviation, but you might want to know uh, over a duration, for example, if uh, two receivers are separated by 300 meters, then they would see uh, the arrival of the wave uh, separated by one microsecond and one microsecond would be the inverse of one megahertz offset from carrier so you would actually want to know what is the phase fluctuation only at a delay of one microsecond which would be the inverse of, of one megahertz if you're interested at widely spaced apart receivers le let's say for example uh, with a, a flight time of a light of one millisecond then you would be interested at the phase fluctuation at one one kilohertz from carrier and so this is represented as a phase noise spectra the unit of uh, phase not spectra is db rad square per hertz or if you're looking at uh, uh, at uh, attenuation of the fluctuation with respect to the carrier that would be uh, dbc db carrier per hertz and these will be uh, closely related between uh, time and phase through uh, the phase to time uh, relationship obviously so in this example uh, you would uh, measure the phase not fluctuation this is one example of uh, a synthesizer which exhibits excellent uh, phase noise close to carrier but you see that the noise floor far from carrier will be degraded by the uh, synthesis of, of, of a SMA 100 uh, Rodenschwarz synthesizer uh, as opposed for example to an oven control crystal oscillator that exhibits excellent far from, uh, from, far from carrier stability but whose close to carrier uh, stability is worse than the SMA so depending on your application if you want to have a very long baseline with uh, uh, long duration uh, propagation you might want to focus on one of these devices here because the noise floor close to carrier is lower if you're interested in in a, in a short uh, time delay between receivers where that would be far from carrier in the Fourier transform here you would uh, uh, rather benefit from the OCXO and so once we're familiar with uh, phase noise uh, spectra well here is the phase noise of the AD9548 uh, either clocked by the octo clock so that's what we just showed earlier with a uh, same distribution circuit uh, feeding at a very close range uh, the two AD9548 and this is the same system clocked by the white rabbit switches and you see that white rabbit basically degrades the phase noise uh, by about 20 dB at uh, something by 100 to uh, from one hertz to one kilohertz which is typically what we would be interested in for a widely spaced apart receivers so uh, synchronizing the AD9548 by the white rabbit has a, a significant impact on the uh, phase uh, noise so the phase stability in the uh, frequency offset that we're interested in here in this in this demonstration um, and once we've done this uh, synchronization well here is the output at 143 uh, megahertz of the 280 uh, 9548 uh, these are observed over one nearly one day you see here this was measured November 16th and this is a persistence measurement until uh, November 17th so you see that over nearly one day there has been no fluctuation so this is uh, on one uh, radio frequency output this is the other radio frequency output this is the reference one PPS and the persistence
resistance over one day did not show any drift or any uh, jump of phase from one radio frequency output with respect to the other and they remain aligned in the same way so the phase stability has been kept with respect to the one PPS. And so if we use the signal to feed uh, sound cards because now we are, uh, have a frequency transposition from radio frequency band to bass band, you see here that uh, using a sound card recording after amplification you still need to amplify the output of the mixer otherwise the signal is a bit weak for a sound card so this is uh, a DC uh, passing um, low frequency so audio frequency 40 dB amplifier and here you've got the tracks of all the planes uh, in magnitude as recorded by a, a stereo sound card and if we look at the phase we see a consistent phase pattern if we focus on this plane over here we see here that the phase has been coherent over the flight of, of the plane uh, across its, its track here you have the phase from minus uh, uh, pi to pi and you see here the phase evolution as the a plane is flying along its track. So we do have a uh, phase coherent output of, uh, of this AD9548. Uh, we've been able to demonstrate how you could synchronize y uh, using White Rabbit multiple X310. We've demonstrated how we can generate local oscillators thanks to the AD9548 for frequency transposition if you don't want to use the upper Nyquist zone. And we've applied this to graph passive radar acquisition. Uh, but it could be actually used for any other radio frequency uh, communication and, and uh, acquisition with distributed uh, emitter or receivers. At the moment we're investigating the spec board. The spec board is one of these PCI Express embedded board that implements uh, White Rabbit on, on their, uh, on their um, uh, FPGA here and in this example we would like to have the fast analog to digital converters uh, fitted on the spec boards to be White Rabbit synchronized. Unfortunately at the moment uh, White Rabbit is reaching the spec board. We manage to uh, um, port uh, White Rabbit drivers to modern uh, Linux, current Linux kernels, which allows us to run the White Rabbit synchronization uh, tools on the Compute Module 4, which is the OEM embedded uh, version of the Raspberry Pi. Uh, yet, at the moment, the uh, analog to digital converters are still clogged by a free running oscillator, which needs to be disciplined on uh, White Rabbit. This is, at the moment, work in progress. Thank you for your attention.